Here we will develop a simple Navier-Stokes solver for incompressible flows of two fluids that have different material properties. The code is developed in several steps, adding capabilities in small increments. The code uses explicit time integration, implemented as the so-called projection method, and a regular structure staggered grid for a rectangular domain. We start by developing the code for flow where the viscosity is constant and there is no surface tension, and the density, which also serves as a marker to identify the different fluids, is updated by solving an advection diffusion equation. The diffusion is added for numerical purpose and is removed once we have introduced front tracking to follow the interface between the different fluids. To find the flow, we solve the Navier-Stokes equation. The Navier-Stokes equations can be written in many forms, all of which can be used as a starting point for numerical approximations. Here, we start from the integral form of the equations, as obtained directly by applying the conservation laws of physics to fluid flow. The differential form may be more familiar, but using the integral forms keeps us as close to the physics as possible and requires minimum number of assumptions. Applying the conservation of momentum principle to a small stationary control volume tells us that the rate of change of momentum in the control volume, the first term, plus the inflow of momentum through the surface of the control volume, given by the second term on the left, are equal to the sum of body and volume forces acting on the control volume. The first term on the right is the net force due to the pressure, which acts normal to the control surface. Then we have a body force due to gravity. The third term on the right-hand side is the viscous force. And the last term represents other body forces acting on the fluid. The last term will include the surface tension, but now we leave it unspecified. We assume that the flow is incompressible, so its volume is conserved. For a control volume, this means that the inflow must balance outflow and that the integral of the normal velocity over the control surface must be zero. Incompressibility is a consequence of the density of each fluid particle remaining constant, and for multiphase flows, where the density of different fluid particles is different, this means that the advection equation for the density must be included in the set of equations we need to solve. Finally, since we are sometimes dealing with a continuous flow field and sometimes with discrete approximations, we need to establish a notation that distinguishes between those two. Here we use variables without a super or subscript for the continuous variables, such as rho, p, and bold u, for the density, pressure, and velocity, and variables with subscripts and superscripts for the discrete approximations. A superscript denotes a time level, and a subscript denotes a discretization in space. We'll use the subscript H for an unspecified spatial discretization and I, J for variables discretized on regular structured two-dimensional grids. To simplify the notation, we divide the integral statement of the momentum conservation by the volume of the control volume and then define the average momentum M, the average advection term A, the average pressure gradient, the average gravity force, average rho times G, the average viscous term d, and the average integral of other forces f. Notice that we denoted the average pressure gradient slightly differently than the other terms to emphasize the fact that the integral is the definition of the pressure gradient in the limit of infinitesimal control volume. The momentum equation can now be written in terms of these definition, giving us the time derivative of the momentum equal to the negative of the advection terms and the sum of the forces. Similarly, we denote the average of the conservation of volume integrals as the divergence of the velocity, since the divergence can be defined by this integral as the volume goes to zero. Because we have to solve several equations, the momentum equations along with the incompressibility condition and the advection equation for the density, we need to decide exactly in what order to solve the equations. To do that, we start by the time integration. The Navier-Stokes equations give us the time evolution of the momentum but we need the velocity and the density separately to be able to calculate the various terms on the right-hand side. Thus, we assume that we can decompose the momentum into the product of the average density and the average velocity defined by integrals over the control volume. For very small control volumes where the density and velocity are essentially constant, this is obviously a very reasonable thing to do, but for flows where the density changes abruptly, this is a more questionable approach, and we will revisit this approximation in later lectures. We now approximate the time derivative by a simple forward-in-time Euler approximation, where the right-hand side is computed at the current time. Here, superscript n denotes a variable at the current time t 
and superscript n plus 1 stands for the variable at time t plus delta t. Notice that we have not put any superscript on the pressure term because the pressure needs to take whatever value required to enforce incompressibility at the new time n plus 1. We start by assuming that we have already updated the density, so rho at time level n plus 1 is given. However, even if the new density is given, we cannot use the momentum equations as written to find the new velocity because we do not know the pressure. For incompressible flow, this is a standard problem. We have two equations for the velocity, the momentum equation and the incompressibility condition, but no equation for the pressure. To deal with this, we use the so-called projection method, where we first find a preliminary velocity field by ignoring the pressure, and then determine the pressure required to make the velocity field incompressible. That is, in the second step, we project velocity onto the space of incompressible vector fields. Thus, the name. The semi-discrete momentum equation is therefore split into two parts by adding and subtracting a term including a temporary velocity denoted by u star. Here we assume that the temporary velocity is multiplied by the new density, but other choices are possible. The first step gives us the temporary velocity using everything on the right-hand side except the pressure, and the second step corrects the temporary velocity by adding the pressure gradient. Adding step 1 and 2 Eliminating the temporary velocity gives us the semi-discrete momentum equation. The pressure is still unknown, but it must be determined in such a way that the velocity at time level n plus 1 is incompressible or divergence-free. To find an equation for the pressure, we take the divergence of the equation for the corrected velocity and use the conditions that the new velocity at time level n plus 1 should be divergence-free. The result is an equation that relates the pressure to the divergence of the predicted velocity field. If the density is a constant, we can pull it out from the divergence operator and we end up with an equation stating that the Laplacian of the pressure is equal to the divergence of the predicted velocity. For variable density flow, the density must stay where it is, and this leads to a more complex non-separable pressure equation where the pressure gradient is multiplied by 1 over the density, which varies in space. We now have a strategy for using the discrete incompressible Navier-Stokes equations to advance the velocity in time. We start by updating the density. Then we find a temporary velocity, u star, using the advection term and the forces except for the pressure. Then we take the divergence of the temporary velocity and use that as a source term for an equation for the pressure. The source term increases the pressure locally when the divergence is negative and decreases it where the divergence is positive. Although the adjustments in pressure are made locally, they depend on the pressure nearby, so we have to solve for the pressure everywhere simultaneously. Once the pressure has been found, we can correct the velocity by adding the pressure gradient. So far, we have only been concerned with approximating the time derivative. To approximate the flow field, we need to divide the domain into finite size control volumes and approximate the various surface and volume integrals. We can, in principle, use control volumes of any shape but here we will define them using a regular structured grid. We divide the domain by horizontal and vertical lines parallel to the x and the y axis, separated by delta x in the horizontal direction and delta y in the vertical direction. The flow field is approximated by discrete variables, and we assume that a variable identified with the intersection of the i vertical and j horizontal grid lines is the average value for a control volume centered at the intersection of size delta x by delta y, as outlined by the red rectangle. Here we show delta x and delta y being equal, but that is often not the case. The benefits of using a regular structured grid, in addition to the simple shape of the control volume, is the straightforward identification of each control volume and its neighbors. We number the grid lines, usually starting from the left for the vertical ones and the bottom for the horizontal ones. And if i refers to the ith vertical grid line and j to the jth horizontal grid line, then the intersection of the grid lines is at a point i, j. In the same way, the next point to the right is i plus 1, j, the next point above is i, j plus 1, and so on. In the slide, the control volume centered at i plus 1, j plus 1 is also outlined in red. Although we may intuitively assume that we should select the same control volume for all the variables, that is not necessary. Indeed, the realization that we do not have to do so is at the very core of the so-called staggered grid arrangement of the control volumes. Although the staggered grid 
appear somewhat confusing at first, it's actually a brilliant idea that leads to relatively simple and robust numerical approximations. It is, however, important to keep the location of each variable straight, and it is essentially impossible to do so without sketching the grid and the control volumes. Thus, draw the grid could perhaps be called the zeroth law of staggered grids. The idea behind the staggered grid is best explained by starting with the control volume for the pressure and the volume conservation equation. The pressure is adjusted to force the velocity to be divergence-free. If there is net inflow into our control volume, we increase the pressure to push the fluid out, and if there is net outflow, we lower the pressure to suck the fluid back in. Thus, we need to find the divergence or net out and or inflow for a control volume around the pressure point. We therefore pick a control volume centered at the pressure point with a left boundary between the I minus 1 comma J and the point I comma J, a right boundary halfway between the I comma J point and the I plus 1 comma J point, a bottom boundary between the I comma I minus um, comma J minus 1 and the I comma J point, and a top boundary between the I comma J and the I comma J plus 1 points. The net inflow into the control volume is the integral of the normal velocity over the surface of this control volume. The inflow through the left boundary can be approximated as the normal velocity at the midpoint between I minus 1 comma J and I comma J times the height of the control volume, or U I minus half comma J times delta Y. The inflow through the bottom is the velocity at the midpoint between I comma J minus 1 and I comma J times the width of the control volume, or V I comma J minus half times delta X, and the outflow through the right and the top boundaries are U I plus a half comma J times delta Y and V I comma J plus a half times delta X, respectively. Thus, the discrete incompressibility condition states that the difference between the U velocity at I plus a half comma J and I minus a half comma J times delta Y plus the difference between the V velocity at I comma J plus a half minus the V velocity at I comma J minus a half times delta Y, everything divided by the volume delta X times delta Y is equal to zero. Or in physical terms, the difference between the inflow and outflow through the horizontal boundaries must be balanced by the difference between the inflow and outflow through the vertical boundaries. The important thing so far is that when we apply the incompressibility conditions to the pressure control volume, we need the velocities halfway between the pressure points. If the velocity was available at the pressure points, we could, of course, interpolate the velocities at the half points, but there is a better alternative where we find the velocities at the edges of the pressure control volume directly. To do so, we define a control volume for the um, U velocity by shifting the pressure control volume to the right, centering it at I plus a half comma J, and we define a different control volume for the V velocity by shifting the pressure control volume up, centering it at I comma J plus a half. This put the pressure on the boundaries of the velocity control volumes and, as we will see shortly, this is exactly where we need them. Unfortunately, not all variables are stored where we need them, so in some cases we need to interpolate. We will use linear interpolation, which is also the reason that we can generally assume that the value at the center of each control volume is equal to the average value over the control volume. We are now ready to write down the discrete form of the Navier-Stokes equation by evaluating every term on the right-hand side of the semi-discrete momentum equation. We start by assuming that the density at n plus 1 has already been found and that it is stored at the pressure point. The preliminary velocity then is given by the momentum at the nth time level, the density times the velocity, plus delta time times the advectional, gravitational, and viscous terms plus the body force, all divided by the density at the new time step since we are using the conservative form of the momentum equation. We write this equation for the u velocity at point i plus a half comma j and for the v-velocity at the i, comma j plus a half point. Each term is evaluated at the center of the control volume for each velocity component, and since the density is not known at the velocity points, we interpolate linearly by taking the density at the velocity points as the average of the density at the pressure points. In the component form of the equations on the preceding slide, we discretized the gravitational term by multiplying the density at the center of the velocity cells, 
found by linear interpolation by the appropriate component of the gravitation vector. You also multiply and divide by the volume of the contour volume, so these cancel. For now, we leave the body force unspecified and denote the averages over the appropriate velocity volumes by fx and fy. The advection terms are evaluated by integrating over the boundaries of the control volumes for the u and v velocities and dividing by the area of the control volume to get the average over the control volume. For the x component, we evaluate the integral by first computing the dif difference in the in and out flux or u momentum through the right hand side of the control volume minus the inflow through the left hand side and then add the flux of u momentum out through the top and in through the bottom. The fluxes are evaluated at the midpoint of each side and multiplied by its length. Thus, the fluxes through the left and right side are multiplied by delta y, and the fluxes through the top and bottom by delta x. The y component of the advection term is found in a similar way by subtracting the inflow of y momentum through the left and the bottom boundary from the outflow through the right-hand side and the top. The velocities and densities are point where they are not defined are found by interpolation. Thus, the u velocity at i plus 1 comma j is found as the average of u at i plus 3 halves comma j and i plus a half comma j. The u velocity at i comma j is found as the average of u at i plus a half comma j and i minus a half comma j and so on. Notice that the velocities on all the sides must be found by interpolation and that while the density at i plus 1 comma j and i comma j are given where they are needed, the density at i plus a half comma j minus a half and i plus a half comma j plus a half must be found by averaging the four values at i comma j, i plus 1 comma j, i plus 1 comma j plus 1 and i comma j plus 1. The advection term for the v velocity is is found in a similar way by interpolating the velocities at the midpoint of each side and the density for the left and right side. To find the diffusion term, we integrate the viscous stresses over the boundaries of the control volume. We denote the deformation tensor by boldfaced capital S and then take the dot product of S and the normal vector on each side. Since the boundaries of the control volume are parallel to the coordinate axis, the normal velocity on each side has only no one non-zero component and only one component of S survives the dot product. Thus, the integral over the vertical sides for the U velocity component includes only S11, and the integral over the top and bottom involve only the off-diagonal terms S12, and so on. The derivatives of the velocities can be approximated by the midpoint rule in a straightforward way. The integral over the vertical sides is twice the difference between the x derivatives of the u velocity on the right and the left boundary times the length of the vertical side, and the integral over the top and bottom is the difference between the sum of the y derivative of u and the x derivative of v between the top and the bottom times delta x. The derivatives are then approximated by centered differences. Notice that, rather conveniently, we have the velocity components exactly where we need them. For the midpoint of the vertical boundaries, we need the u velocity to the left and the right exactly where they are defined, and similarly, for the midpoint of the horizontal boundaries, we need the u velocity above and below the point again exactly where it's defined, and for the x derivative of the v velocity, we need the values to the left and the right, right where they are defined. For the v velocity diffusion term, the integral over the top and bottom includes the s22 term, and the integral over the sides involves the s21 term, which is, of course, equal to the s12 term. The integral is approximated by the midpoint rule and the derivatives by the center differences using the velocity components exactly where they are defined. When the viscosity is constant, we can simplify the diffusion term slightly by using that the flow at time n is incompressible. The derivation is left as an exercise, but the viscous terms reduce to the sum of the standard finite difference approximation for the second derivative of the velocity components. Although we used the simplification in the first version of the code to make it as short and readable as possible, we know that in general the viscosity of the different fluids is different, so in later version of the code we will have to use the full viscous terms. Gathering the terms, we find that the predictive velocity is given by the momentum at time n plus delta t times the terms in the red curly brackets. Those consist of the advection terms and gravity in the first three lines plus the viscous terms and other body forces in the last term.
Since we are working with the equation in conservative form, and it's really the momentum that we are updating, the whole right-hand side, inside the black curly black brackets, must be divided by the density at the new time. The code to update the velocities consists of loops over the velocities. As we will see when we grid the entire domain, the size of the grids for the different velocities can be slightly different, so we generally use two separate loops, one for the u velocity and another for the v velocity. In both loops, the predicted velocity is the momentum at time n plus delta t times the parentheses that contain first the advection term, then the gravity term, and finally the diffusion term, since here we leave out the extra body force. We have attempted to make the code essentially the same as the discrete version of the equations as written in the previous slide. The reddish patch shows the black and the red curly brackets, and the yellowish patch shows the advection terms. 